Welcome back. I'm Linda Kincaid. We are following the breaking news out of Japan, where former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has been rushed to a hospital after being shot. It happened as he was giving a speech in the city of Nara in western Japan. The fire department reports that Abe was in a state of cardiorespiratory arrest. Abe is the country's longest serving prime minister in office from 2006 to 2007 and again from 2012 to 2020. He stepped down in September of 2020, citing health problems. When nearly a day after the British Prime Minister resigned, there are pressing questions about the next government and how it will operate without Boris Johnson at the helm. He defiantly vowed to not go down without a fight. But the Conservatives' mutiny proved to be too powerful to withstand after a series of damaging scandals. Johnson reluctantly announced he'd be stepping down without actually saying the words out loud, calling the decision painful. He'll stay on as caretaker prime minister while the party works on appointing a successor. It is clearly now the will of the parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new prime minister. And I've agreed with Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of our backbench MPs, that the process of choosing that new leader should begin now. Well, Boris Johnson's possible replacements include some of his former top ministers whose resignation set off the fatal wave of defections. Another likely contender, former top ally Michael Gove, who was sacked on Wednesday after advising the Prime Minister to resign. Conservative, part, conservative party officials say they'll reveal a timetable for a leadership election by Monday. There will not be a general election. With this now from London is journalist Martha Gill, who writes extensively on British politics. Good to have you with us. I do want to get some context from you on the big question of why now. Because so many scandals, others arguably much worse than the one that led to his downfall, uh, have occurred in the past few months, in the past few years. And, and you wrote in the New York Times that he's a man whose bluster and foolishness seem to transcend every rule of political practice. So what was different this time? Yes, I mean, he's had so many near career ending moments, so many moments of which, um, particularly this year, it's been predicted he is about to go. I mean, you could say that, that this was just a final straw. There was this, a scandal came to light where he had appointed a, a, a man called Chris Pincher, um, uh, who he had known there were um, serious sexual um, um, harassment allegations against to a position overseeing party discipline and welfare. Now, that is obviously a, a, a bad scandal, and uh, you might expect logically that to be the moment that um, his MPs turn on him, but it is hardly the worst thing he has done. He broke the law. Uh, he was fined for breaking his own COVID rules. He presided over a culture um, of uh, rule breaking in his top team, something which was officially found. The list goes on. Now, what was interesting about this moment uh, was that he did something very unusual. He broke with tradition and issued a sincere apology for his behaviour, where previously he had blustered on, uh, denying uh, that he had done anything wrong. Moments later, two big resignations, which then caused a domino effect um, throughout the party, happened. And that struck me because it reminded me of an earlier point uh, where he had almost apologised in January uh, for breaking um, COVID rules. Live on air, an interviewer had cornered him into, um, into a real expression of regret. And immediately after that, members of his team started talking about um, submitting vote, um, letters of no confidence in him. Everyone pre uh, predicted his uh, downfall and he only recovered um, and stopped um, all the, all the rumours and talk about these being his last days when he recovered his usual bluster the next day and acted as though he'd done nothing wrong. Um, and, um, and, and I, I want to ask Martha about his bluster because he said... Hmm. Uh, in his resignation speech, uh, that he tried to convince the party, uh, but his his ability to convince them failed. Let's just take a listen to what he said. And in the last few days, I've tried to persuade my colleagues 
that it would be eccentric to change governments when we're delivering so much and when we have such a vast mandate and when we're actually only a handful of points behind in the polls. I regret uh, not to have been successful in those arguments. Uh, Martha, he made it sound like it wasn't his scandals that brought him down, but rather the fact he couldn't convince his party that he was the right person. Still, even now, it, it seems like he doesn't take any responsibility for what has transpired. No, he doesn't. And that is very characteristic of Boris Johnson. And as we were just saying, perhaps is the secret to his success. I mean, he's right in some senses that there's no system for bringing down a prime minister who acts immorally um, and who, um, who does the things that Johnson has done. He's right that it's a sort of system of herd behaviour, um, a Darwinian system, which is two other phrases he used in his speech, um, uh, um, a rather kind of primitive one to bring him down. And often his MPs act in their own self-interest, watching to see what other MPs will do. They wouldn't want to move by themselves, they need to move as a group to be more effective, and also trying to assess whether or not um, he will allow them to keep their seats in the next election. And, and that is how it works. A much fairer system would have brought his tenure to an end much sooner. Much, much sooner indeed. <laughs> All right, Martha Gill, we'll leave it there for now. Much appreciate your, your time. Thanks very much. Well, the war in Ukraine is fueling a famine thousands of miles away. Ahead on CNN Newsroom, our Clarissa Ward shows us how that impact is being felt.